Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. Welcome to the second day of week two of the Gameathon hosted by Bit Project. Today we're here with Professor Rowe from Drexel University, and he will be analyzing how Super Mario Bros. paved the way for video games. So I'm going to let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much, Hannah. Hi, I'm Professor Rowe. I teach game design and production at Drexel University. Before that, I also spent 20 years as a professional level designer and game designer at places like Electronic Arts, DreamWorks Interactive, LucasArts, and other places. And I am also a game historian. I teach about video game history, and I've also written about video game history as well. And I want to take a look at one of the most famous games of all time, one of the most influential as well, uh, especially now that it, the game is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year, uh, Super Mario Brothers. And I want to take a look at how Super Mario Brothers came to be, where it came out of, what the designers were thinking when they made the game, and also uh, take a look at the very first level, level 1-1, and all the design decisions that went into that level. So to begin, we talk about uh, Super Mario Brothers. It's important to think also which version of Super Mario Brothers we're we talking about. Uh, we have the main Super Mario Brothers for the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System here in North America, and also uh, the Famicom version that was released in Japan. Those came out in 1985 at about the same time. You can see the difference in box art uh, between the two regions of between North America and uh, Japan. But there are other versions of Super Mario Brothers. There's the versus Super Mario Brothers in the arcades. Uh, Japan would often uh, test market their games for the Nintendo by bringing them to America in the form of arcade machines. And uh, what you'd have here is almost exactly, but not quite the same thing you'd play on a Nintendo, uh, except people would play, pay 25 cents a pop. To, to play. And uh, this is actually a game that you can get a version of on the Nintendo Switch right now. It's a pretty good version of that. But there's also a version for Japanese computers. The uh, Sharp X1 and PC-88, which were pretty much Japan-only computers. Uh, there's a version of Super Mario Brothers called Super Mario Brothers Special, developed for those computer systems by Hudson Soft. Uh, another big game company at the time. And we'll see some unusual elements of uh, in these games. Like uh, we see barrels and uh, hammers coming out of Donkey Kong and uh, also some enemies and elements from Mario Brothers. A couple of earlier games start appearing in Super Mario Brothers that aren't in other versions. But let's talk about how we got to Super Mario Brothers, how this little plumber came to take over uh, video games as a whole. And it all really started back in 1980. Nintendo had been a Japanese company uh, that had started to make a little bit of a foray into the United States. And they really wanted to get into that North American m market. So they were going to form uh, Nintendo's North American offices. So the president of Nintendo of Japan, Hiroshi Yamauchi, called upon his son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa, to go to America and found Nintendo of America for the first time. And Minoru was uh, excited, uh, pensive uh, might be a better word for uh, the honors of trying to open Nintendo's first North American studio. And they needed a product to launch to really get the ball rolling, to get a fresh start, this new scrappy uh, little uh, Japanese company entering the North American market. They needed a hit game and he knew exactly which game he wanted. And that was Radar Scope. Uh, Radar Scope is a game that came out in 1979 in Japan and had done pretty well uh, and in a wake of a lot of Space Invaders clones. And basically it's it's another clone of Space Invaders, but it kind of had this weird sort of 3D effect where you're looking up a bunch of skyscrapers or something. Um, anyway, done well in Japan. Minoru Arakawa said, yes, we need that. Uh, I'll show you a little sample of some of the gameplay. Uh, and Space Invaders had come out in 1978 and it had taken over the arcades, not only in Japan, but as well, uh, North America as well. But now, two years later, 
people are getting kind of tired of the same old gameplay of a bunch of aliens up at the top of the screen uh, coming down at you and you had to shoot them while moving your base left and right. Uh, by this time, other games were coming out, Asteroids, Pac-Man, that were exciting people in new and different ways. But uh, Minoru Arakawa decided to order 3,000 of these units to come over to America to their new headquarters in New Jersey at the time. They first uh, put their uh, first warehouse in New Jersey. So ordered 3,000 units to come across the ocean all the way up to New Jersey from Japan. And then they found they could only sell a thousand units. That meant their warehouse was sitting there with 2000 unsold units, uh, just collecting dust and not making them any money. And that is a good way for your business to go broke. If you can't sell two thirds of your merchandise, well, what are they going to do? Uh, they, needed some sort of Hail Mary pass or something. Uh, they couldn't send the machines back to Japan. That would cost so much in, in <clears throat> just in shipping. Uh, but they also couldn't do anything with these radar scope units. They didn't know what to do. So they came up with a novel idea uh, that is kind of that became standard later. Uh, but the idea was, well, the game isn't going to sell, but what if you could swap out the insides and put up some new art and put a different game inside. That way you don't have to ship the monitor. You don't have to ship the cabinet. You don't have to ship the, uh, the, the joystick. You don't have to ship the power supply, all this stuff. You can just send the game on some chips and put some new art on the sides and have a new game. Now, uh, that was completely novel, uh, but the, it could work. Uh, so they decided, all right, what have we got? Well, we have to make a game that works with a joystick and one button. That's what it has to use because that's what the radar scope machines have and that's all they've got to work with. So they brought on um, this young guy, Shigeru Miyamoto, who was a staff artist at Nintendo. He had never made his own game before, but he had helped design the look of one of their uh, sort of breakout clones and also uh, the art for Sheriff, the arcade game. And he worked on some other games, but this is the, he was given the task of making this game that's got to save Nintendo of North America. So he was given the task and he set to it. He's like, all right, I'm going to make this, um, this game about this American hero on a bunch of platforms going up and down and trying to rescue the damsel in distress. And of course we all know that was Popeye. Popeye. Yes. Popeye. Originally Shigeru Miyamoto thought, Let's make a game about Popeye. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of elements that this that that would uh, foreshadow what would come later with Mario games. Um, and why Popeye? Well, Nintendo actually had a relation with King Feature Syndicate, who owned Popeye as they were developing this little uh, digital handheld Game & Watch game at the time that was about to be released. But they couldn't work out the rights to this uh, new Popeye game. And we see it was designed with uh, sort of radar scopes limitations in that there's a joystick and there's one button. But Mar unlike Mario, Popeye was designed to punch. He does not jump, he only punches, which makes sense. It's it's Popeye, he, gets, he eats his spinach and hits people who needs to be hit. But, um, so while this game was originally designed to be the game that would save Nintendo of North America, it didn't get released until 1982, another year later, while the rights had to be worked out with the owners of the rights to Popeye. And where did this inspiration come from? We find that Shigeru Miyamoto was actually influenced by this early cartoon called A Dream Walking, in which uh, olive oil is, is sleepwalking across this construction uh, this uh, this skyscraper under construction, and the two uh, Bluto and Popeye fight to try to rescue her from sleepwalking to her oblivion. But we can see this is set up kind of like uh, a, a side scrolling or a a a a, a platformer game uh, right here. Uh, just the views of the cartoon. It looks like a situation with this platformer. There's different girders you can sort of ride up and down on and and walk across and all these different levels. You can see the elements of uh, future Mario games here uh, as well. Uh, 
So couldn't make Popeye. So he just changed the storyline a little bit, changed the characters very slightly. And we have finally Donkey Kong. We have another game about an American hero, this time from Brooklyn, uh, rescuing a damsel in distress from this big oaf. This time the oaf is a gorilla uh, named Donkey Kong. And so they sent the uh, Donkey Kong innards to, uh, to Nintendo of America. Nintendo of America went into their, uh, their warehouse, took all the radar scope machines, took off the art, put on Donkey Kong art, took out the, the chip inside that had radar scope, put the Donkey Kong chip inside, slapped some stickers on the side, and thus they had Donkey Kong machines. So we can see here on the left, radar scope machines have a red uh, case, a red cabinet. The changed out don the 2000 Donkey Kong machines that they made from radar scopes also have a red cabinet, but all later Donkey Kong machines actually have a blue cabinet. So if you ever see a red Donkey Kong out in the wild anywhere, that is one of those very rare original 2000 Donkey, Donkey Kong machines. And it had something uh, distinct and different. It had four different levels that sort of emulated this little hero climbing up higher and higher and higher into a skyscraper before he finally rescues his uh, girlfriend, Pauline, from the clutches of Donkey Kong himself, which was rather new because at the time, video games, you had one screen. Uh, you'd clear out the screen of uh, any... Uh, clear out the screen of any enemies or anything like that, and it would start you out with a new screen, but the enemies move a little faster or something like that. This is the first time, well, you actually explore different levels and different places uh, every time the screen refreshes. And uh, Miyamoto actually originally wanted a continually scrolling screen, so you're constantly going up, up, up the skyscraper, but unfortunately, the radar scope hardware he had to work with just couldn't do that. So he broke it up into four different screens. And we can look forward to Super Mario Brothers, and I've examined the, the, um, a lot of the design notes that went into Super Mario Brothers and see what elements they wanted to bring from Donkey Kong into Super Mario Brothers, the first title. One of the, the things they planned for was having slopes, these sort of sloped uh, platforms you can walk on. And actually, no, there are no slopes in the original Super Mario Brothers. They decided to cut that. It was a little, uh, uh, it probably would have required more tiles than they had to work with. And so they had to cut that. Lifts, these little elevators, uh, that was in the design notes. And yes, you see a lot of lifts throughout Super Mario Brothers. These conveyor belts that have what looks like a little pie. It's actually a platter of cement uh, running along them. Uh, no, they wound up cutting those, even though they're in the original design docs. And ladders. Got to have ladders. How else are you going to go up and down? Uh, no, there's no ladders. <laughs> so out of these four major elements of Donkey Kong, they planned to bring into Super Mario Brothers. They only brought one over, and that was the lifts, and that's it. <laughs> then trouble happened the next year when Universal uh, uh, decided to sue Nintendo because they were afraid people would confuse King Kong with Donkey Kong. Well, uh, so this lawsuit went through. It looked like it was going to just destroy uh, this little Nintendo of America company. They needed a good lawyer, and they hired a good one uh, with uh, Howard Lincoln. Howard Lincoln looked at the, at the case, did his research with his other uh, legal uh, coworkers, and found that uh, actually Universal themselves, back in 1976, with regards to this other King Kong movie that had come out in 76, just six years earlier, that actually proved that King Kong is in the public domain. And now six years later, they were trying to sue that they had copyright over King Kong when they proved that it, nobody owned King Kong at the time. Uh, the judge, of course, found heavily in favor of Nintendo from this egregious uh, abuse of the law from Universal Studios. And uh, as a reward for his excellent work and, and in many other things, Howard Lincoln actually wound up as vice president and general counsel for Nintendo of America and was a, a, a face of Nintendo for many, many years, actually. Also in 1982, 
what do you do if you got a hit arcade game? You make a sequel. We say Donkey Kong Jr. And uh, in a lot of, one way that it's rather unusual, the Mario is actually the villain. You play as Donkey Kong's son, Donkey Kong Jr. And you must defeat the wicked Mario who has captured your daddy. Uh, it's hard to think, it's hard to imagine Nintendo today making a video game in which Super Mario is the villain. I don't think they'd ever do that, but here we have Mario. He is the villain. Much like Donkey Kong, it had four different screens you went through, and uh, uh, it, it was sort of like Donkey Kong, but then more, more so. So it was more climbing. It's a little more athletic, you might say, in its design. Um, and the ending, you get to save your papa, and Mario falls to his doom. Blah. Uh, uh, just as they had done for Donkey Kong, uh, the developers of Super Mario Brothers brought forward some elements out of Donkey Kong Jr. And uh, what they called out in their design notes were things like the vines. You can climb up these vines, which are which work a little differently from um, from ladders did in the first game. And yeah, there are vines. Funny enough, though, in Super Mario Brothers, they're hidden. They they aren't revealed. Uh, they're only for secret passages to, to unknown realms. There's logs, these sort of logs that you can walk on, and they're almost exactly the same in Super Mario Brothers. And these springboards, these are like trampolines you can jump on and bounce on. And yes, they are definitely in Super Mario Brothers, and they sort of expanded the, the playability of springboards in uh, Super Mario. Now, about the vines, there's something interesting about that. It's supposed to be a secret. There's lots of secrets in Super Mario Brothers. That's part of its appeal. There, there were so many things you talk to your friends at the schoolyard or uh, try to figure out, oh, I found this secret passage to such and such. And you tell your friends, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I found this and that other thing. Um, so it encouraged a lot of talk and comparing notes with your friends in a big way because there were so many secrets in there. So the fact that there are vines in the game was also a secret. But if you have an instruction booklet for a game, you've got to say how everything works. So how do you tell that uh, part of your control pad can do something like climb when the fact that there's something you can climb is a secret? So what they did kind of uh, this kind of smart way shows what the control pad does. If you hold down left, you move left. If you hold down right, you move right. If you hold down, you crouch. If you hold up, it just has some question marks. So it's hinting to you that like moving up will do something better try it somewhere uh, without revealing the secret of what up is actually used for. The next year, Mario brothers comes out, which is a fun, weird competitive and cooperative two player game. Uh, Mario and his brother Luigi seen for the first time are plumbers uh, working in Brooklyn and trying to clear these sewers of all these monsters and weird creatures that are appearing. And uh, as you can imagine, Mario Brothers had a lot of things that were going to be brought over to Super Mario Brothers. And according to the design notes, they wanted to bring over uh, the way you attack. Um, so in Mario Brothers, you can punch a, a monster from the floor underneath it, and then you kick, kick it away once it's flipped over. And there's something similar in Super Mario Brothers. You can punch a creature from the floor underneath it. Uh, the enemies behave in similar ways, like the turtle-like uh, shell creepers in uh, Mario Brothers would, once you flip them over, they could flip back and, and, and fix their shell and start, uh, being a, start attacking you again, kind of like you do in Super Mario Brothers. Uh, they also want to bring frozen platforms, these slippery, slidey, icy platforms, but no, we didn't see that until Super Mario Brothers 2. Same with these POW blocks. You punch a POW block and everything gets knocked over. Again, that we didn't see that until Super Mario Brothers 2. So I'm trying to get across is even experienced developers like those who are like uh, uh, Tezuka and Shigeru Miyamoto and, and their team working on Super Mario Brothers, there are sometimes things they plan to put into a game that winds up needing to be cut for one reason or another. It happens to everybody. Trust me, I've made enough games where we've had to cut things. Everybody has to cut things. And they cut things that were supposed to be designed for Super Mario Brothers. And the game, I, it's hard to say, the game would have been much better with frozen platforms as opposed to not. 
Other things we find in Super Mario Brothers from Mario Brothers. Coins. The entire concept of coins comes from Mario Brothers. The fact that you can have a superhuman jump or a fall. See, in Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr., if you fell from a height higher than your head, you die. You're dead. That's it. Uh, and it took actually some other Nintendo employees convincing Shigeru Miyamoto that, no, it would be fun if you could jump way high in the air and you could fall any distance, that that would be fun. This is something Shigeru Miyamoto almost said, like, no, no, we've got to have these realistic falls and jumps. Um, but finally, he was convinced otherwise, and thank goodness he was. It's hard to imagine any Super Mario game without a uh, superhuman ability to jump. And, of course, Luigi. We see Luigi for the first time in Mario Brothers. We can't have Super Mario Brothers without Luigi. Donkey Kong 3 came out the next year in 1983 uh, with Stanley the Bugman uh, fighting Donkey Kong. And this wasn't even developed by Miyamoto's team um and originally wasn't even going to be a donkey kong game it was going to be a game called greenhouse and it got donkey kong kind of at the last minute uh what did the developers want to bring over from donkey kong 3 to super mario brothers nothing at all not a thing there was nothing here it's not even really um uh, a really <laughs> a uh, Donkey Kong game, to be truthful. Uh, I see a comment. Uh, people want to hear the little tune that happens in Mario Falls. I was not able to share audio on this presentation, I'm afraid. Uh, so I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, what else influenced Super Mario Brothers? So we've got this collection of Mario games, starting with Donkey Kong. Uh, what else was does does Miyamoto and their, his team call out as influences? One of the things was Excite Bike, which is another early Nintendo Entertainment System game in which uh, you are a dirt bike racer. And one of the neat things is you can uh, select uh, whichever track you want to go on to. So there's five tracks that get a little more difficult. But if you start the game up and you want to skip ahead to track four, you can do that. So Miyamoto liked that, but he didn't want people to just jump ahead to track four right when they start playing the game or anything like that. So he designed these warp zones specifically so that a, a player who's been playing a while, if they're, uh, they're good at exploring and they've discovered all these secret methods of jumping around in the game, they can warp through the game. But a new player isn't going to necessarily know about them. So they're not going to get ahead to a world that's too tough for them. Very clever. And, and, and it's like, again, uh, it's part of that adding secrets to the game that made it more interesting and, and very compelling and people encouraged to explore more. Also, Kung Fu Master, also known as Kung Fu. Uh, what they really liked is having this big environment that scrolls very smoothly across the screen. Uh, and that was something that they insisted had to be in Super Mario Brothers. As you run fast, the entire screen has to go by very smoothly and not like jitter or anything like that. And another game was Balloon Fight. This is a game that's kind of like the game Joust. You're on a couple of balloons and you sort of have to flap your arms in order to fly higher. And uh, this was so much of a um, an influence that actually the code, if you will, uh, of how Mario swims is exactly the same way as how the main character floats in Balloon Fight. It's, it's the exact same motion. They just pulled the code and, and used it from one game to the other. Uh, so that's an overview of how we got to Super Mario Brothers uh, as well. Uh, and... And, and now that we've reached this point, I want to take a look at the very first level of Super Mario Brothers. Allow me to switch over real quick. And this is uh, World 1-1, probably the most famous level in video games. And it is one that has been analyzed quite a bit, I admit. But I think it's worth looking back and, and trying to get the right context for this level. There was a lot that Miyamoto and his team had to teach players to really understand how to play this game. Um, platformer games were still relatively new. Uh, Donkey Kong was one of the first. There's only a couple of games before that that you might call platform games. Uh, 
And this was really the Donkey Kong was really the first one to involve jumping in a in a meaningful way. Um, players still didn't necessarily understand how to jump and, and, and to fight a character. In fact, uh, Mario Brothers, the game, the Mario game that came before this, you couldn't even just jump onto an enemy. You had to knock them over by hitting them from below, and then you could kick the enemy uh, off the screen. Uh, but jumping onto an enemy? Like any time a player would touch an enemy, they had been taught that's dangerous. That's going to get them killed. So they figured, okay, we got to teach players how to jump on enemies and we've got to teach them. Um, also super Mario brothers involved being able to like move in midair and all these different, very subtle things. And you accelerate to run and you stop and, and all these sorts of things. Um, or just even using a controller like this for the first time. Uh, there's a lot of other, let's see, I might have a joystick around here. Um, a lot of other uh, controllers before this were simply a joystick with one button, and that's about it. Maybe two buttons usually, sometimes a keypad, but we won't get into that. This had, you know, these two big red buttons, but also these two other buttons. My goodness, there's four buttons on here. How am I going to touch, how am I going to handle four buttons? My goodness. Um so there's a lot of new things that players were needing to be taught just with this game, but they didn't want to use text and they didn't want to assume you're going to read the instructions. So how do you teach the player with this? So imagine you're sitting down. It's uh, you just got the latest hottest game. It's 1985 or 86. Uh, it, it, you've got the in Nintendo entertainment system. You plug it into your TV. You, you pull out this cartridge, super Mario bros, plug it into your system, turn it on, and you're just hitting, you're just pounding on the start button. You're just like, I'm ready, let's go, let's go. And you play it for the first time. And I want you to th kind of unlearn anything you've learned about um, video games up to this point and, and try to approach this with uh, without knowledge of every other platformer game you've ever played that has been influenced by this game. I know it's kind of hard to do. Uh, but the screen opens up. There's not much to see. There's a guy standing there. He's looking to the right. That kind of gives me the thought that maybe I should move to the right. Also, there's a big open space to the right. People want to go towards what's what's kind of open and free. Uh, there's another thing to notice here. Uh, as I let the video play a little bit, you can kind of walk around. There's nothing threatening you at the moment that you start playing. You have a little space to get used to the controls and try to maybe figure out, okay, this moves around, this jumps, this whatever. Um, a lot of games that coming out of the arcade, especially as soon as the game starts, you're under attack. You got to go, 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 go. Not so here. It's a beautiful, bright blue sky. It's a sunny day. Uh, everything's good. Nothing's trying to kill me yet. There's puffy white clouds. There's little green bushes. The puffy white clouds look exactly like the little green bushes because they're the same tile, just with different colors. Um, you're allowed to explore a little bit right at the beginning. And that was something new. So, okay, uh, I, I've got this guy. I'm the only thing on the screen, so it must be me. And I'm going to try to move around. And eventually, you might hit a button. You'll jump. you move a little bit. And then this box kind of looks like this. It will appear on your screen. <laughs> And you'd be like, whoa, what is that box? It's flashing. It's really trying to get my attention. It's it's a mystery. I don't know what it is. It's such a mystery. It has a question mark on it. What? So I don't know what that is, but I want to go check it out. So I want to get a little closer. So I start moving closer. I start moving closer. All right. And, oh, what is that? There's this weird looking thing coming at me. I don't know what it is, but it looks mad. It's got these big bushy eyebrows and it is not pleased. There's something else. There's something about the way it is moving that gets my attention. It's coming straight at me. It's, the, it's a menacing behavior. It's coming at me. It's going in the opposite direction. I am. Uh Oh, I don't, I haven't picked up a gun. I don't have a rocket launcher. I can't, don't have a karate chop. I don't know what to do with this thing. I don't know how to attack it. I know. I, I guess I better run. 
I got to run the other way before it gets me. Help, help. Uh Uh-oh. This is where you learn that you can't move to the left. You can only move to the right. In fact, learning to move to the right is the most important thing. Because if you move, as long as you move to the right without hitting anything and keep moving to the right, you'll get to the end of the level. Keep moving to the right after that, and you'll get to the end of the world. Keep moving to the right after that, and you will reach the end of the game, and you will defeat Bowser. All you have to do is move right. That is the most important thing to learn. And you can't go left. And now you're stuck. Now it's coming to you. You can't run away. Maybe you figured out that you can jump now. So maybe you figure, okay, maybe I can jump over this thing and get past it. I can run the other way. Oh, I didn't jump far enough. And I stepped on it. And now he's flat and I got 100 points. Oh, I jump on monsters to defeat them. I got it. And again, this is new. This is not something that was standard in video games up to this point. This set the standard of jumping on monsters to defeat them. Because it used to be any way you touched a monster would kill you. Here, you have like really tough boots or something and you could squish them. Oh, okay. Now I get it. Um, And this whole incident, this whole sequence with the Goomba, the Goomba was created for this moment to teach you about jumping onto monsters. Originally, it was going to be a Koopa Troopa. But if you play Super Mario Brothers, you know, if you jump on a Koopa Troopa, it leaves a shell behind. You can kick the shell. The shell can bounce off something and kill you. It was decided that's a little too hard to deal with. Let's make a new character and and he's just squishy and you can just jump on him. That'll be the first character you defeat. That's the whole reason there are Goombas anywhere in the Super Mario universe. So maybe I come a little closer. I punch up and hit this box and it makes this gling sound. And uh, well, something looks like a gold coin comes up. I don't know what coins are good for. I don't know if there's a store somewhere in the game. But I like that sound. Oh, that sound. That cash register sound. It fired off some endorphins in my head. and Like, I want to hear that sound again. I love that sound. I want to hear that sound over and over again. Um, and so the sound is part of the coin reward in itself. People like that sound. And so they want more coins. So look, here's some more question marks. I bet those are going to give me more coins. Uh Uh-oh, that's not a coin. What the heck is that thing? It looks like a poisonous mushroom. Uh, Fortunately, it's way up there on the platform, and it's going away from me. Now, this moves differently than enemies. Enemies will come right to left towards you. Power-ups will move left to right in general, uh, encouraging you to chase them. It, it, one is threatening and one is, hey, come and chase me. But it's a very subtle sort of psychological hint. And uh, Miyamoto and his team were finding that people were avoiding the mushrooms. I mean, they even look like that first monster I had to defeat. It's kind of the shape the same way. Uh, so Miyamoto and his team had to figure out, okay, how do we get it so people are forced to hit the mushroom? We got to do some something clever so they always hit the mushroom. And this there's this clever little bit of level design right here in these just couple of blocks uh, of shapes. So you might be thinking, okay, thank goodness it's going away from me. It's not a threat. Now now it's a threat. Now it's coming at me. Here you learn that things have gravity. Here you learn that things bounce off of walls and it comes at you. I'm going to jump over it. Oh, I couldn't jump over it. Why couldn't I jump over it? Oh, because there's this platform over my head. Great. I hit the mushroom. Now what happens to me? Oh, now I'm big. Oh, cool. Oh, I can smash bricks. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Now, try to imagine the difference the game would be if you started as Super Mario and then got hit and reduced to Little Mario. Ah, That wouldn't feel good at all. But if you start as Little Mario and then you become Big Giant Mario, that feels awesome. That feels empowering. Uh, And then you came... Next thing is your first vertical jump challenge. And it's not much of a challenge. It's the same height as you are. You can just tap on the jump button and get over it. Next vertical challenge. Oh... It's if I tap on the jump button, I'm not getting over it. This is probably the first game where you have to hold down the jump button in order to jump higher. And you had to learn how to do this. I specifically remember having problems with this when this game first came out. And I remember talking to other kids like, how do you jump over? And like, eventually you just get mad and you hit it so hard that you make it over. You're like, oh, it must be how hard you hit the button. You know, if you hit it hard enough, you'll jump higher. That wasn't quite it. 
It's the longer you hold it down, you jump higher, but at least you'll, you'll figure it out. So eventually you'll make it over that first big challenge. And what do you have next? You have an even bigger challenge to make sure that you actually learned how to do a high jump. And so this is the maximum height you can normally jump is, uh, is right here. Now we have two Goombas and we can see they bump against each other in reverse direction when they do. And there's something else here to learn, uh, but I'm going to try to jump over them. I did not. I did not jump over them. In fact, I hit one and then bounced off it and hit the other and I got even more points. Oh, I can do combo moves. Oh, cool. All right. I'm learning something at every step. This is great. Uh, I jump over another big jump. And now if you, you're an experienced Super Mario Brothers player, you know that you, you press down and you go into a secret passage and you get a bunch of coins. But I don't know that. I've just picked up the game. I don't know uh, that I can go into these pipes. Maybe I think they're flower pots. I don't know. I, I'm not going to try that. I'm going to just keep moving on. Now, this is very important. And this is one of the cleverest bits of level design in the entire game, I'd say. Um, here we have your first long jump. Yeah, it doesn't look like much. It's two blocks wide. But Miyamoto and his team found that what people would do is they'd, they'd go back as far as they could for a running jump. And they'd run, 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 and jump right into the pit. Every time, right into the pit. Because at first, when you're playing the game, you're not used to the way Mario can accelerate and decelerate and move in midair in different ways. Um, so people would kind of overcompensate. They jump early and fall right into the pit. So how do you solve that? How do you keep people from jumping in the pit? And I'll show you. I will back up. And I'm going to take a running leap heading right for the pit. And what happens? Oh, what? What? Oh, what? So now I did not die. <laughs> I did not fall into the pit. And in fact, I discovered a secret. And that secret gave me a one up. And now if I try to run and jump over the pit, I have this little block here to guide me. I know that I can wait until after I pass that block and then I hit jump, I should make it over the pit. Very smart, very clever. So on the one hand, I would die and just start the whole thing over again and feel miserable. In this case, I feel smart, surprised, clever, and elated that I get to try again. Oop, let me get that out of the way. So for the rest of, I want to look at the rest of the level. I'll just go screen by screen this time. So this is the next little bit of that level. And what is this trying to teach me here? What it is, is it's showing that, all right, the game has showed me that I can jump onto monsters to kill them. But maybe I played Mario Brothers, the original Mario Brothers before, where I had to punch up from a lower level to hit monsters above me. This is your first chance to do that. And you can come up and you could punch the bricks as the Goombas are walking across it. And you'll kill the Goombas. And you're going to be able to pick up a, a power-up as well. Now, this is interesting. First, it's the first encounter with a Koopa Troopa. You just, you learn that they, they flip over and they leave a shell behind and that sort of thing, and you can kick them. But uh, what else is important is this, this Fire Flower power-up. How do you get that? Because you punch it from underneath, the Fire Flower comes up, but then it stays there. So now you have to figure out, how do I jump up there? And that's when you learn that you could jump to this lower platform you could steer right and then steer left again in midair. Again, it wasn't really steering. It wasn't a while jumping in, in former games. Usually you jumped. If you're standing still, you jump straight up and straight down. If you're moving, you go a set distance with, with your jump. Your jumps were always the same. Here you have complete, well, almost complete midair control while you're, uh, you're jumping. And that was new. That was something you had to be taught. Here we have this next sequence. You have a pit, which is not very dangerous. And then you have a pit that is dangerous. So the first time you're hopping up these squares, you go hop, 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 and usually hop right off the last square and right into the pit. But it's okay, because there's there's a floor here. And you, then you get to try again. Now you take your time. You go hop, 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 and then run and jump. So it's teaching you how to go up these like little stair step spaces, which is important for the end of the level. So you go hop, 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 hop. You need to stop on this platform and then do a running jump to try to get high onto the flagpole for the most points. But this level isn't done yet. It has a little bit more to teach you. 
because at, at the end you've, you've cleared it, you get your points for your flagpole. Maybe you get a few fireworks. That's another secret that, that lasted a long time. It took a long time for me to figure out why you get fireworks at the end. And then what happens as you're moving to world one, two, you see the castle you just passed and you walk forward and you walk into a pipe to go underground. You can go into pipes. Wait a minute. Didn't we see some pipes in World 1 once? So the next time you play, maybe you try going down the pipes, and that's when you discover one of the hidden coin rooms that you can get through. Uh, so one one is very informative that it even teaches you things after it's over, like before the next level begins, really begins. Um, and it is, it is a masterpiece of teaching the player without a tutorial level without a bunch of text pop-ups, without a little helper creature coming next to you and said, it looks like you're trying to jump. Can I help you? Or anything like that. Um, and so still, if you 35 years later, this game is still fun. And if you have not played it, I do recommend you try to get a copy. Uh, um, uh, uh, Switch, there's a couple good uh, versions of it. Uh, you can get the, uh, the new... Wait, let me unplug this so I can move it into uh, the new tiny little NES that, <laughs> that Nintendo put out. And these are great, uh, great little emulations. Or, of course, what I always recommend is getting the original um, NES system. But that those are getting fewer and far between. That is my analysis of Super Mario Brothers. I thank you all for joining me today. Uh, I want to close this out. And I think think we could have time for a few questions, perhaps. Uh, let's see. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So this is actually part of a uh, lesson I give about the history of Nintendo. Uh, I teach game history at uh, uh, at Drexel University. And so this is actually incorporated into part of a lecture. Uh, yes, Bonster. <laughs> what is your question? Uh, if you do have a question, you can go ahead and post them in the comments. I think they are on the right of your screen. And uh, it's not too uh, uh, it's easy to say that Super Mario Brothers is one of the most influential. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, one of the most influential games. Uh, if you do play it and feel like, oh, this is just like every other game I've played before. The reason is because Super Mario Brothers has been an influence on every other platformer game that came after it, pretty much. And uh, People, I think, discovered that also with Super Mario 64, the first 3D Super Mario game. Uh, you find a lot of elements in that game that would become um, the standard by which all third-person action games of its type, not even necessarily platformers, would follow. And uh, so you could go back and play that and see like, oh, this is just like every other game. That's because every other game copied this in some way. Um, it's very few other... Uh, platformers, 3D platformers that did something different. Uh, a few exceptions are like Jumping Flash. Uh, it was just kind of an obscure, uh, uh, kind of an obscure PlayStation One game in which it is actually a first-person platformer. Um, uh, another question: like, I like how Mario introduces controls, but in not in a frustrating way. Find it hard doing that in our own games, though. Yes, that's true. What are good ways to introduce? mechanics i uh, creating a i always find creating a rather safe environment where the player can get accustomed to their mechanics so not necessarily a tutorial if i can avoid it myself but uh, a space where they can just sort of have fun with the mechanics uh, think of making like a a playground to show off their mechanics where they're not necessarily under threat and that i think is a good way to introduce new mechanics to a player uh, what game? Bitproject.org. 
Ooh, that, that one sounds important. What games would you say have the best design, especially for students to get inspired from on their first projects? Hi, yes. Uh, I say uh, go start simple. Uh, start with these earlier games and look at them. Don't think because, well, they're just old. They're What am I going to get out of this? I, I'm making an, a, a totally realistic first-person shooter that, uh, with, look at the shading on this person's cheek as I shoot them, you know, that sort of thing. You get lost in worrying about graphics and lighting and things like that. And I understand that. I've been there, of course. But uh, kind of step back and think of just what is just enjoyable to do. What is the, well, what is the, always saying, what is the core loop of your game? What is that core experience? And what does the core loop even mean? It's that thing the player has to do over and over. It's the main thing you do in the game. It's uh, it's that main sequence. Like uh, Ms. Pac-Man. What's Ms. Pac-Man about? Ms. Pac-Man is about dodging ghosts and eating uh, pellets and clearing a board. And then you sort of repeat that sequence over again. That's the main core loop of the game. Now, there are other things that, have, that, that support that main loop, like eating a power pellet, and then you can go chase the ghosts for a while. But then you come back to that main core loop and even the mechanics of that loop use the same mechanics of moving left, right, up and down um, as the main core loop. So really nail down like what is the most important thing? Think of your think of your game mechanics as verbs. They're things you can do, right? Uh, what is it you want your player to do? What are their verbs? That's what I always tell my students. What are your verbs? And those are the actions you can take to interact with the world in different ways. And then make those cool. But I didn't answer. <laughs> what games would you would you say have the best design? Um, uh, let's see. Obviously, Super Mario Brothers is one to pull from. It kind of depends on uh, what uh, type of game you're making. Uh, but don't be afraid to go back to see what a previous generation before you had done in your genre that you're trying to design for. Uh, because there are still things I might I may look back on from a er, much earlier game and realize, you know, this has this is, was fun, but it hasn't really been explored in a while, and I might bring it forward into a newer game. The games that your students have developed that left a lasting impression uh yeah sure i'm gonna plug one of my student games uh, uh let's see there's a little title resilience by sungrazer studio uh just won the games for change student award this year that uh, was my senior project team uh from last year so they just graduated and uh very proud of their work uh, about um yeah, it's it's about running a refugee camp for a group of aliens who have had to flee their home world due to uh, a massive cosmic disaster. And so you need to work through what are real some real world problems of trying to help refugees, make sure they have housing, make sure they have food and clean water, uh, make sure that they have what they need when you don't necessarily have a lot of funds to deal with. And um, so it sort of emulates a real world practice of refugee camps, but um, abstracts it into a science fiction experiment. And uh, you you might just learn something. Uh, they're sort of published. <laughs> uh, actually, they made me a copy of the game on disc, uh, but you can go to, I think it's sungrazerstudio.com. I'm gonna say that. Look up Sungrazer Studio and their game resilience and uh check it out you could download uh, for yourself and try it as well on your computer for uh, windows and i can't remember if we did mac but <laughs> um what role does game development play in social good uh that was something my that group of students had a question for as well. And uh, something that I sometimes teach, but really Dr. Frank Lee, who is about to be on a top, uh, a round table talk with me. Ah, somebody found the link. Thank you, Bonster. Uh, uh, games can be a part of social good. And Dr. Lee and I 
um, who, again, I'll be talking with in a few minutes. We uh, teach a class called Serious Games, and we try to take a look at how games can have uh, a reason for being other than pure entertainment, how they can educate or influence or uh, inform people of the news or get you to feel what it's like to be in somebody else's situation. All these, all these different things. Or it could be a call to action, even. There are all these things that games can be besides just entertainment. But when I teach, of course, I always tell my students, you should still be entertaining. You should still be fun. Nobody's going to care about a serious game if it's not fun, if it's not engaging, if it's not engrossing in some way. Uh, that's why I'm particularly proud of uh, Sungrazer and their work. Uh, so that's why I keep plugging them. <laughs> But uh, good question. It is hard to do a good game that also has some element of social good. Um, and that's why the Jam Games for Change Awards uh, exist, actually. Uh, so that's a group that's been around for a few years now that tries to uh, call out and reward those games that do have an element of social good and hopefully are still good games as well. It's not easy. It's, it's tough. <laughs> How do you think game design is going to change in the next five to 10 years? Uh, we've already seen a big change from it in that it has become so available to people. Now, it, it, most people have the technology needed to make at least some games. Um, an in, inexpensive computer uh, can now do 3D modeling. Uh, before you needed a very powerful computer to do such things. But now, uh, you know, uh, as long as you're keeping things simple, you don't need a super powerhouse computer. And also the tools are much more, wide, more widely available than they ever have been that you need. Uh, I mean, you can download Unity or Unreal Engine and just get started right away in developing games. And um, that they used to be, <laughs> they did not used to be free. Uh, that's only relatively recent that they were. Or there's a, a, a myriad other game engines you can use. In addition, there's tools like Blender out there, uh, GIMP, that allow you to, unfortunately named uh, software, but allow you to do a lot of things you'd normally see in Photoshop. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Bonster, yes, it is hard to get into game design uh, because I don't know if you know this, but people really like video games. <laughs> and there are a lot of people out there who think uh, that like, if I like playing video games, that should be enough to get into the industry, right? But, so there's a ton of people who want to get into the industry. Uh, so you do have to kind of stand out, uh, I find, and uh, prove yourself and do more than just like, hey, I play a lot of video games. Well, great, that's a good start, but you need to be able to do more. You need to play with a sort of critical mind and, and thinking about, okay, when I play this game, think about the decisions that were made in that design. Like, why did they put this block here? Or why why isn't this work like this? What, what, does, what are these decisions? Because everything you find in a game has been because of somebody's decision somewhere that they made. Um, so... But try to figure out what is the intent behind all those all those little elements you see in a game. Uh, last question, what kind of developer are you? Focus more on coding side or design or more game theory mechanics. Uh, so I've been a professional game designer for over 20 years. I've uh, started out in level design and then with also I've kind of always been in level design, but I've also stepped into more game design, AI design, um, things like this. And I do a little bit of coding as well. Um, I have a CS degree, uh, but most of my coding is more just scripting. So, you know, I could do C sharp stuff on, in unity all day long, things like that, but I'm not programming like a, a thing to display the graphics or, or, or anything <laughs> or memory manager or the hard stuff like that. Um, okay. looks like we're about five minutes. Uh, and I'm going to need, there's Hannah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I think we have to close up. <laughs> yep. Um, so 
Professor Rowe, thank you so much for doing this presentation. I really enjoyed hearing you talk about the evolution of the design of Super Mario Bros with Nintendo and then the gaming industry in general. And thank you so much. Um, so at 4 p.m. PST in five minutes, we'll be having a career panel with both Professor Lee and Professor Rowe. Um, and then after that, at 6 p.m. PST, we'll be having our second stand-up for the week on Discord, where you guys can talk about ideas or progress for your project, or you can help others on their own projects as well. Um, so please keep an eye out for these events, and we hope that you can tune in for them. Thank and thanks for joining us. Have a good one. Bye. <laughs>